Did you know that Alexander the Great had a habit of renaming cities after himself? And in one case, he even named a city after his beloved horse. Stick around to learn all about Alexander the Great in honour of his birthday. Hello and welcome to World History Encyclopedia. My name is Kelly and in honour of the birth of Alexander the Great, on either the 20th or 21st of July, 356 BCE, we're going to be answering the questions, who is Alexander the Great? Why is he so famous? And was he ever defeated? Happy birthday, Alexander. Don't forget, the easiest way to support us is by giving this video a thumbs up and subscribing to our channel and hitting the bell icon for notifications so you don't miss out on our new uploads every Tuesday and Friday. Alexander the Great, also known as Alexander III of Macedon, became King of Macedon after the death of his father, King Philip II, in 336 BCE. Alexander is known for both his military might and his diplomatic skills, which aided in his expansion of the Macedonian Kingdom to an empire of a size his father had not even dreamed of. Alexander is recognised as a key figure in the spread of Greek culture and language throughout the ancient world, and his death sparked the beginning of the Hellenistic period, which spanned from 323 to 31 BCE. After his death, his campaigns became legendary, and later Greek and Roman generals learned from his successes and failures, and were influenced by his tactics. When Alexander was young, he was taught to fight and ride by Leonidas of Epirus, and how to read, write, and play the lyre by Lysimachus of Acarnania. When he was 13 or 14, he was tutored by the Greek philosopher Aristotle until he was 16. Perhaps due to Aristotle's teachings, which encouraged tolerance, Alexander never forced the Greek culture on those he conquered, but simply introduced it to them. Despite his father Philip II laying the groundwork for Alexander to be successful, Alexander claimed all the credit for himself and chose to call himself a son of Zeus, claiming to be a demigod, modelling his behaviour after his two favourite heroes, Hercules and Achilles. This claim was in part due to Olympias, Alexander's mother, claiming that his was a virgin birth and that she was miraculously impregnated by Zeus. Alexander's childhood friends, Hephaestion, Cassander, and Ptolemy, would all become lifelong companions and generals in his army, and Aristotle's great nephew, Callisthenes, who was also a friend, would become the court historian and follow Alexander on campaign. At 18 years old, in 338 BCE, at the Battle of Chaeronea, fought between the Macedonian Empire and the Greek allied city-states. Alexander's military skill was first noted when he turned the tide of the battle for a Macedonian victory, and afterwards, the Greek city-states were brought under Macedonian rule. In 336 BCE, just two years after the Battle of Chaeronea, Philip II died, and Alexander assumed the throne as King of Macedon. Alexander wasted no time in embarking on the extensive campaign that his father had been planning, the conquest of the Persian Empire. As king, Alexander the Great moved into Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, in 334 BCE, with 32,000 infantry and 5,100 cavalry, and in May of 334 he fought the Persian satraps, or governors at the Battle of Granicus, and was victorious. According to Alexander, he then liberated the cities of Sardis and Ephesus from Persian rule, although his word liberated has been understood as the conquest of these cities. In 333 BCE, Alexander fought the Persian king Darius III at the Battle of Issus, a battle famous for its depiction on the Alexander Mosaic. Alexander defeated Darius's larger force, and he then sacked the Phoenician cities of Baalbek and Sidon, and in 332 he laid siege to the island city of Tyre. The siege of Tyre is a famous example of his commitment to victory and his ruthfulness. In order to bring his siege engines within striking distance of Tyre's walls, he had his army build a land bridge out to the island, which is how the island city became linked to the land as the site still is today. 
and, in response to the stubbornness of the inhabitants of the city refusing to surrender, he slaughtered most of them and then sold the survivors as slaves. In 331, he moved to Egypt and conquered it, and founded the city of Alexandria there, named after himself, of course. Alexander had a habit of naming cities after himself, and even his horse, Bucephalus, but we'll get to that later. Alexander marched his army across the desert to the oasis of Siwa so that he could visit the oracle of Zeus Ammon that presided there. Alexander knew of the infallible reputation of the oracle who had been consulted by the heroes Heracles and Perseus. Alexander asked the oracle whether his father was truly Philip II, and the oracle declared his true father to be Zeus Ammon. There was no military value to marching to Siwa and losing some men to the desert. It was either to satisfy his megalomania, or a cleverly calculated PR stunt to spread the myth of him being a demigod. Or both. We will never know. The next phase of Alexander's conquests is known as the Persian Campaigns. In 331, Alexander met Darius III in battle once again this time at the Battle of Gorgamila, which is also known as the Battle of Arbila. Alexander was victorious again, Darius fled the battle, and then Alexander took the cities of Babylon and Susa, which both surrendered to him. It's safe to say that Alexander was on a roll. In the winter of 330, Alexander and his army marched to Persepolis and defeated the Persian hero Ariobarzanes and his sister Utab Ariobarzan at the Battle of the Persian Gates. And after Alexander was victorious, he set Persepolis on fire, probably in a drunken folly. In the summer of the same year, Darius was assassinated by his cousin and general Bessus, which Alexander thought was deplorable. After the death of Darius, Alexander crowned himself the King of Asia, gave Darius the burial of a Persian emperor, and then marched his army into Bactria, what is now modern-day Afghanistan. If you haven't noticed by now, this man does not stop. Between the years 330 and 327, Alexander campaigned in Bactria and Sogdiana, and won every engagement, and in 329 he destroyed the city of Syropolis, defeated the Scythians, and founded another city named after himself, Alexandria Ashate, on the Ixertes River. It was around this point that Alexander began to portray himself not just as a liberator of cities, but as a god. He adopted the title that the rulers of the first Persian Empire used, Shahanashah, which means King of Kings, and the Persian custom of proskinesis, which meant that those who addressed him had to kneel and kiss his hand. To say that his Macedonian troops were unhappy about this is an understatement. His troops became increasingly unhappy with his adoption of Persian customs and were growing more and more uncomfortable, so much so that assassination plans were formed. Of course, the conspirators and those who committed treason or questioned his authority were found out and executed including his close friends Cletus, who was killed with a javelin, and Callisthenes, who was imprisoned and died in confinement. In 327, Alexander married the Bactrian woman Roxana, and then set his sights on India. The Indian king Omphus of Taxila surrendered quickly, but the Aspasioi and Asekanoi tribes resisted. By 326, Alexander had subdued the tribes, then fought King Porus of Porava and his war elephants at the Battle of Hydaspes River. In true Alexander fashion, he won the battle, and then made Porus ruler of a larger region than he'd previously held because of how bravely he and his troops had fought. During this battle, his horse Bucephalus was killed, and so, of course, he named the city Bucephala after him. By now, Alexander's troops were exhausted, and they didn't want to go any further, and it took some convincing, but finally Alexander decided to head back to Susa. Half his troops were sent by sea, and half he marched through the Gedrosian Desert, where many died of thirst and starvation. Why he chose to do this we don't really know. When he finally arrived back in Susa, he found that many of the satraps he left in charge had abused their power, so he executed them as well as those who vandalised Cyrus the Great's tomb. 
Alexander wanted to merge the cultures of Macedonia and Persia more. So in 324, he held a mass marriage service in Susa, where he married Persian noblewomen to senior members of his staff. And to connect himself to Persian royalty, he married one of Darius III's daughters. His men rejected this cultural merging and his adoption of Persian dress, and they really didn't like how he merged the Macedonian and Persian army units and promoted Persians to high positions, even though it seems this was an effective policy in furthering his goal of uniting the two cultures. So, after looking at all these battles which Alexander the Great took part in during his short life, was Alexander the Great ever defeated? No. No, he was not. In the year 324, his closest companion Hephaestion died of a fever, and Alexander's grief was inconsolable. Arian wrote that Alexander killed Hephaestion's doctor because he failed to heal him. Alexander declared a period of mourning and gave him the funeral rites usually reserved for a king. A year after the death of his closest friend and companion, Alexander the Great suffered 10 days of a high fever before he died on June 10 or 11 in 323, at the age of 32. There are a few competing hypotheses regarding the death of Alexander the Great, ranging from poisoning or assassination, typhoid or malaria, and new hypotheses continue to be suggested. More recent suggestions for the cause of Alexander's death are the West Nile virus or Julian Barr syndrome. Ancient sources say that Alexander's body didn't begin decomposing until six days after he was proclaimed dead, and GBS could be the reason why. Alexander may have been experiencing paralysis, which meant his body would not have needed as much oxygen, so it may have looked as if he wasn't breathing. Ancient doctors didn't use the pulse to determine if someone was alive, but rather if they were breathing or not. So when Alexander was confirmed dead, he may have not actually been dead for another six days. He left no will and named no successor, resulting in the wars then waged by his generals, which tore apart the empire he had created. Out of these two so-called successor states, two became powerful states in their own right, Ptolemaic Egypt and Seleucid Persia. Do you believe Alexander the Great really was great? Let us know why or why not down in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel and hit that bell icon for notifications so you don't miss out on our new videos every Tuesday and Friday. This video was brought to you by World History Encyclopedia. For more great articles and interactive content, head to our website via the link below. World History Encyclopedia is a non-profit organisation, so if you'd like to support our work, you can head to our Patreon via the link in the top corner of the screen or via the Patreon link down below. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you soon with another video.